time. So um, I'm going to click through these slides real quickly. Uh, so Xinjiang is in the northwest part of China. It's a huge area about the size of Alaska. And it borders uh, many countries. So it borders Mongolia, Russia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India. And you can see why this this region will be so important because uh, it, it it's literally sits on the um, kind of the linchpin of China, China's connection with the wider mm -hmm. uh, countries to its west. And <laughs> from the Google uh, <laughs> satellite image, you can see the geographic feature of Xinjiang. Uh, it's a, the the place is cut. Ha cut into half by the massive Tianshan mountain range, which starts from the eastern end of Xinjiang that runs all the way into Kyrgyzstan. And there, so the two parts of Xinjiang, north and south, are defined by the Jungar Basin in the north and the Tarim Basin in the south. But as you can see, they're mostly deserts. So in the north, the Jungar Basin has the uh, Kurban, um, Kurban Tungut uh, Kurban Tonggu Desert, and in the south, the T Tarim Basin is filled with the Takla Makan Desert, which is actually the world's second largest moving sand desert. The the top, the number one is Sahara. So that gives you an idea how big this uh, area, how big both Xinjiang and the desert itself. Um, and the little green space you see are the oasis uh, being fed oasis area that's been fed by the glacial runoff on the Tianshan Mountain. And this is the mm -hmm. area where people actually live. Oh. So <clears throat> even though Tian, even though Xinjiang is a huge place, um, the, the, the population mm -hmm. is actually very sparsely populated because, you know, there's only a limited amount of water supply and people can only live in these oasis towns. And I'm gonna go way. I'm gonna give you the whole wrong history rundown of yeah, Xinjiang from prehistory. So the 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 horse domestication actually happened just across the border from Xinjiang in what is present day Kazakhstan uh, at the Botai culture. And what the horse uh, domestication allows for humans to nomads to travel wide distances. Uh, you know, there's a there's a huge Eurasian steppe land that, that stretched from Hungary in Europe all the way to Manchuria. And after the humans domesticated horse, they were able to travel through this whole expanse of land. But um, interestingly, genetic study revealed that uh, the people who first domesticated horse in Kazakhstan, uh, they domesticated a different breed of horse that's not the ancestor of the modern domesticated horses. It domesticated what's today known as the Mongolian wild horses. So the people who actually ended up domesticated mm -hmm. the horse that we know today, they happen to be on the western steppe, so between the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea. And these people uh, called the ya ya um, Yamnaya culture, and they the, the current hypothesis link them to the proto-Indo-European speakers. So once they, they acquired um, horse domestication and more probably more importantly chariots, they were able to expand in all directions. So one branch of them invaded Europe. Uh, that's where uh, after they conquered Europe, that's how they brought the Indo-European language to Europe. And with the uh, Neolithic farmers that already exist in Europe, they start to form the, the, the basis for the modern European uh, population. And another mm -hmm. branch of them went east and they, they went into Central Asia, Southern Siberia. Another branch went to India, to, to Iran. And, and that's when, uh, and one reason for this is probably invention of the chariot. So the world's first chariot was discovered uh, in the Shintashtar, Shintashtar culture in southern Russia, which is just uh, just a little bit north of Kazakhstan. So you can see it's already pretty close. It's actually not that far from Xinjiang. Tianshan Mountain is right here. The Tarim Basin is right here. This is Xinjiang. So the, this is a reconstruction of the world's first chariot. And once they acquired chariot, they start to travel all different places. 
And then these people start to show up in Xinjiang. This is a famous uh, <coughs> beauty of Lowland, uh, or other known as Taran, ba- Taran mummies, <laughs> named after the Taran Basin where they're discovered. Um, the <coughs> um, Actually, I remember uh, Victor Meyer, one of this old orientalist uh, scholars in US, you know, he used to crow about how they're, they have Caucasoid features, you know, their red hair, <laughs> all that stuff. Uh, but modern genetic study revealed that they actually was already a mixed population by the time they reach Xinjiang, <clears throat> because as the steppe nomads expand in all di- directions, um, they start to mix with local population. So her uh, her matrilineal uh, mitochondria DNA actually mm-hmm. traced to southern Siberia. Um, so this is uh, this is another famous tower mummy, the the beauty of Xiaohe. Uh, this was discovered in two, uh, around two thousand by the Chinese archaeologists in the. In the again in the Taran Basin because Taklamakan Desert is a very dry place, so these these mummies were naturally preserved because of the, the, the 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 dry climate. But these people they didn't leave any writing records. So this is prehistory. You know, this was about three thousand five hundred years ago. And in, moving into more historical time when we have writings, uh, this the a new empire arose from the Mongolian steppe called the Xiongnu. Xiongnu is actually a modern Mandarin pronoun- pronunciation. Uh, the, the, the older Chinese pronunciation is actually mm-hmm. probably more close to Cantonese. So this Xiongnu is actually back then would know as Hongnu. Hongnu, that's where the Hans come from, you know, Hans from, from Wulan for people that, that, that may be interested. Uh, the, the whole new empire, they expanded from Mongolia and they subjugated the region in Xinjiang. Um, at the time, the, the what's the present day Xinjiang is also known as Xiyu or the Western region, literally in Chinese. And it's, it's, a, it's, it's a series of um, oasis city states um, but they were subjugated by the whole new uh, empire. They had to pay tributes. And the whole new empire come into direct conflict with the Han Empire in uh, present day China. And and what happened then, uh, you know, the Han Empire were seeking allies to fight the nomadic Hongnu. Um, and one of the Hongnu's uh, traditional enemy, Yue Zi, fled from their home in northwest China all the way to present day Afghanistan. So the Han uh, Emperor uh, sent an envoy, uh, Zhang Qian, to go west to, to seek alliance, to form an alliance against the Hongnu um, Empire. And, and this will become the start of the Silk Road. And so this is a, 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 a mural in the Dunhuang mural of the, Zhang, the, uh, the Han envoy Zhang Qian marching to the, to the west. And as a result of this uh, military alliance and uh, the Han Empire launched a series of expeditions against uh, the Hongnu in the steppe. And then they um, also send an army into this, uh, the, the, the area of Taran Basin of present day Xinjiang and basically um, offer the, the local rulers like, look, if you break away from Hongnu uh, and join us, you don't have to pay tributes. Uh, you know, the, we, <coughs> we will give you gifts instead. So this became a, a, a West region protectorate around 60 BC. Um, and also Zhang Qian's uh, mission to the West eventually mm-hmm. formed the basis of Silk Road and that established formal um, relationship from China to the wider West. And the reason the, the Silk Road goes through the region is, you know, the geographic features that this is, this part area is a massive Tibetan plateau. It's hard to cross. And in the North is a hostile nomads. So the, this area, uh, the Silk Road then passes through this very narrow corridor and goes through the different oasis towns in Xinjiang. Mm-hmm. So next slide. Um, this is one of the, uh, by Han Dynasty, this, this stuff like this start to turn up. This is, was a, 
This is an arm protector discovered by the China-Japan Joint Expedition Team in 1995. This is a Han Dynasty era arm protector. It has uh, the the Chinese character uh, Wu Xin Chu Dongfang uh, Li Zhongguo, which literally means when the five stars rise in the east, it benefits China. And then there's another um, piece of fabric that was excavated in the same place in the Nia ruin near Kotan in present day Xinjiang. Uh, and you can see this, this shows an influence of West and East. Uh, you have this kind of the Indo Greek influence uh, uh, a, a figure over here, but you, you see a Chinese dragon over here. And, and so Xinjiang by, by then became kind of a crossroad of cultural exchange. And this is a mm -hmm. map of the ancient Silk Road. Uh, it starts from, from uh, Xi'an, China, and it goes through both the north and the southern rim of the Taklamakan Desert of the Tarim Basin. And then from Kashgar, you branch out, either go to through Afghanistan, to India, subcontinent, or further west to Iran, Iraq, um, and the, on to the Roman Empire. And it's, you know, for the people who are more familiar with the current China Belt and Road Initiative or the AKA's new Silk Road project, um, there's also yeah. a marine time Silk Road, but, but Xinjiang is very important for the land. It goes right. It's like goes right through um, the Belt and Road, right? Uh, in the route to Europe. Yeah. Yes. 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 Um, and this is uh, some of the murals, frescoes of uh, from the time. So this is from the oasis state of Kucha in, in Xinjiang. And you can see the kind of the Indo-Greek influence. This is a, a Buddhist cave, you know, so these are um, because at the time Buddhism starts spread from India into area of Afghanistan, into Kashmir, and then it came to Xinjiang. Um, and in in Afghanistan, you know, uh, during the 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 times of uh, Indo, uh, Indo uh, the, the the Greek Pak Bactrian Kingdom, which was the descendant of Alexander the Great, great soldiers, they incorporated uh, kind of like the Buddhism, but also like the the, the Greek. Um, uh, statue building. They, they started to build a lot of the Buddhist statues. They started to create images of Buddha. Um, before, like, that wasn't a thing. Uh, but the, the, the Greeks in Afghanistan, they started to make Buddha statues and the painting of Buddha. And this, this, then Buddhism was carried over on the Silk Road into the present day Xinjiang area. And this, this mm -hmm. became a major Buddhist region. Uh, and most of the time, these uh, Buddhist donors that's painted on the wall, they're actually modeled under the local royalty, uh, local noble <coughs> noblemen. So this will play an important role in China itself because um, this is, again, this is a painting of the Kucha's uh, king, queen, and the, uh, and the crown prince from about 500 AD. And and uh, again, the, the area control of the 